So next, I'd like to introduce our second speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Shoji Nakayama is an MD and holds a PhD in public health. His expertise is in exposure science, especially of children's exposure. He's a certified public health specialist slash supervisor by the Japan Board of Public Health and Social Medicine. In 2005, Dr. Nakayama was invited to the US EPA and worked on exposure research on perfluorinated alkyl compounds. In 2009, he moved to the engineering laboratory in EPA to help risk management of the emerging contaminants. Then in 2011, he joined the National Institute for Environmental Studies in Japan. He's a lead exposure scientist for the Japan Environment and Children's Study, which is a longitudinal birth cohort study involving 100,000 mothers and children. Dr. Nakayama collaborates with US, EU, and Asian researchers to advance and promote children's environmental health research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yakuma. All right, so I'd like to thank um, chairs of this conference uh, for inviting me here, uh, giving me such a uh, wonderful opportunity to, to, to be a plenary you know, speaker here. I didn't know that I had, I'm going to speak in this enormous room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to thank my friend uh, Mark and Werner to recommend me myself <laughs> to the chair. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about you know, how uh, can birth court studies contribute to knowledge and policies of the world to reduce risks of emerging contaminants. I'll, I'd like to talk about a little broader uh, in that broader aspect. Uh, but before we go into the, uh, my talk, this is my start of my career. You know, um, I, I, I graduated medical school and then and, uh, did an internship in a small hospital uh, near shipyards. And I was treating uh, patients from shipyards. We treat the patients and they go back to work and they come back again. And then I felt that we need to treat the cause of those people coming into the hospital. So this is uh, a picture that I was, I'm, I was researching uh, on my uh, PhD thesis. This is a ship, uh, ship, making, ship building company who are using styrene to make plastics, fiber reinforced plastics. And then the guy who is sticking the hands to measure the styrene is me, myself. <laughs> And this is my start, the career, and then that brought me up here. Uh, and the Dr. Lin Andrew Lindstrom invited me to uh, work at the EPA in 2005. Actually, I'm having a flying pan coated with the Teflon, and so I started working on uh, developing methods for uh, measuring perfluorinated comp compounds in. Uh, and, and there are many kinds of samples, and worked with uh, Jessica Reiner just uh, behind me here, and then the other uh, other guys, Mark Schreiner, and then so so I spent six years with the EPA, and then after that I got invited invited to join this uh, uh, wonderful study called Japan Environment and Children's Study that involves hundred thousand mother children pairs. And then we follow up them until the kids become 13 years. We started uh, discussing uh, the follow-up study of, uh, beyond 13 years already. And so I'm not going to talk about uh, the details about this, uh, this study today, but the study uh, collects biological samples during pregnancy, at birth, and after birth. And then we collect many informations with the questionnaires, also uh, site visits, and you know, home visits, and uh, physician's examination of the part of the participants. And then we recruited 103,000, little over 103,000 mothers. And then we, we have following, uh, we have been following a little over 100,000 kids right now. So, we need to put children first, all right? So uh, when you choose next president, just think about children first. If you, if you put the children first, everything goes right. Uh, I'm not talking about your own children, but 
uh, you, uh, the children in your community, children in your society, children in your nation, children in the world, uh, if you think about them, I think everything goes well. Um, and I, I found an interesting article and online, and, and it says it compares the children now and uh, to the children for 40 years ago in 1970s, where uh, uh, when I grew up. And then it was were about the U.S., but interestingly, it was pretty same in Japan. You know, the kids were kids. Uh, there weren't labeled as ADHD or any, uh, you know, hypertension, hyperactivities, but they, they just uh, played around outside doors. You know, they, their son was the, uh, you know, our friend, and then uh, nobody were terrified of being exposed to sunlight without, you know, scribing their sunscreens. And then we played in dirt and then washed our hands with soap and water. Uh, we never had any antibacterial something at that time. <laughs> and then kids in the uh, 70s, this is in Japan, I'm, I'm, I'm for sure that you guys were the same. You know? We were playing like this. I did exactly the same like this, you know, uh, at the liver behind my house. But nowadays, it is prohibited. Kids can't play alone. They have to be accompanied by adults. They can't jump into the river. And kids have to play inside. And then they are surrounded by plastics. Here, you know, every, everything was made by plastics. And even this, you know, they have a kid's room, their own room, full of plastics. And also they have sophisticated uh, devices to learn, even in preschools. You know, they use touch pad, smart pad for I'm not sure they are what they are learning, but uh, they, they, they use that. They don't interact even with their siblings. You know, they just play with the devices by their own. What's going to happen if they grow up? And then even this. So who believes that? So in, back in the 70s, we didn't have such a things, none of those things. Will those kids using this kind of devices be cleverer than us? So that's the question we need to answer. So what is happening uh, in this 40 years? This is an article uh, written by Weinstraub in Nature. On, back in 1975, the diagnosis rate of autism was one in five Thousand. But we had the sharp increase in diagnosis. And nowadays, it's in less than, uh, it's more than one in 100. So everyone in the class could be autistic. And she also uh, speculated the, the causes of this, this surge and attributed 25% to diagnosed accretion. <coughs> accretion I'm sorry. And then also greater awareness and parental age and spatial clustering, but about half of the course is unknown. And pediatricians also feeling like that. Why those kids with such problems are increasing? And genes have not been changed yet. You know, we haven't changed generation yet. And this is an article, I took this picture, nice picture from Mary Gilbert at the EPA, who pub, uh, the published in 2012. We now know that disrupting thyroid axis in HPT axis could damage brain, neurodevelopmental, so it causes neurodevelopmental effects. We know some chemicals uh, disrupt thyroid function. 
And this is the statement from the Ministry of the Environment, uh, no, I'm sorry, Ministry of the Health in Japan. We are having an increasing number of children suffering from sleep disorder due to decrease in sleep period and late bedtime because of uh, the parents' work later. And then kids have to go to bed later. And then also we are having an increased number of obesity in Japan because of the diet and sedentary lifestyle and also parent perception. And then Leo Trisande's group in uh, New York University just put out this estimate that uh, uh, in Europe, we have the economical loss of about 160 billion euros a year because of this uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. If you divided that by uh, health effects, the neurological effects is the most. And if you divide it by the chemicals, the pesticides the most, they estimate. So the contaminants of the emerging, emerging con uh, concern includes some legacy contaminants with new exposure or health effects like lead, we had in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, and uh, existing contaminants uh, with new health concern like PFAS that are existing for the uh, past you know, 50 years, but we are seeing some effects on thyroids and other, other endocrine systems. And substitutes and alternatives that are supposed to be safe but with insufficient evidence. And then also new chemicals, who knows? And then we have known knowns and unknown unknowns and unstaff. So how birth cohort study can address that kind of issues? You know, birth cohort studies select the population, uh, select the samples from population, and then we uh, observe exposed and unexposed for a long period of time, and then take a look at who, what's the difference of the rate of the kids being, you know, sick or uh, not sick. So, so that's the basic of the birth cohort. And then here's the article from uh, Arujo, uh, in uh, published in 2018, that depicts numbers of birth cohort studies going on in the world. It, that, it, this, this, this graph does not include Jax yet. But uh, uh, you can see this. There are many birth cohort studies going on in the world. And there's a site here, birthcohorts.net, invent, uh, to inventory many of those things. But it's not comprehensive yet. And I took this picture from uh, Dr. Kishi's uh, uh, article in 2017. This is uh, the picture, this is the map of the cohorts that joining Asian cohort, birth cohort consortium that is called BICA. So we have many birth cohorts running in Asia too to address this kind of questions. And then what's, what's measured in those kind of uh, birth cohort studies are uh, chemicals and air pollution and also climate and built environment and green spaces. And then for the health outcomes, they measure reproductive uh, outcomes and congenital anomalies, neurodevelopment and immune system and endocrine system and some leuke leukemia or other cancers. And then our group just looked at uh, an article it's published in EHP, and then we did the review on that and what's been known so far. I put some examples here. In a perfluorinated compounds, they investigated, uh, so they used cohort studies or cross-sectional uh, studies, but the, here we picked up the studies that showed the positive effects of perfluorinated compounds exposure during pregnancy and their effects in children. There are some uh, neurological effects, there are some uh, thyroid effects, and there are thyroids. There are many things. 
And some of them, some of the studies reported no, uh, you know, no effects. So there are many birth cult studies already up running, doing wonderful jobs addressing the problems. But the challenges we're facing, uh, the questions what I get every day from the policymakers are, is that chemical the cause? That's the cause and the effect? Or what does the effect, what this, for example, what does the, uh, the drop of IQ5 means? Is that, if that means we're getting full, we're getting mean? And how many people are affected? What's the safe level? What happens if the broad level exceeds the safe level? What if uh, we have this and that at the same time? That's the question we have to address. And then what matters most to policymakers and politicians are different, quite different to what matters to scientists. I put the example on the, on the right side. So what matters most to politicians or the case report, how many people died. And then before they die, before people die, they don't move, all right? But we put most emphasis in randomized control in a trial or cohort study. So we had some gaps, and then with the cohort study, it takes time to get results. So I'm having, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm always asked when your result come up. <laughs> it's been seven years you studied this study. What's the result? I'm sorry, this is a cohort study. It takes a long time. And then 10 years, we put out the result. What's the relevance? You know, that's 10 years ago. <laughs> it's a dilemma. So we need to combine case, co case sec uh, cross-sectional studies and cohort studies together. We have to be clever. And here's the path forward. You know, this is the best word, best thing I learned from my experience with the EPA. We need the path forward. So EPA set out the path forward, many of them. I'm not sure how many of them are, you know, done, but anyway. <laughs> so this is an exposome. It's, it's well known right now, put out by the Chris Wild, uh, the director of the IARC. So we are exposing to the environment. Uh, so we have to do life course birth uh, cohort. That's, that's a challenge for us. And then also, we can do genome. And then People trying to do exposome. So we should do genome by exposome. We were doing gene by environment, and now next stage is genome and exposome. We have to go. To do that, we need modelers, we need statisticians to join us, to, and then also chemists to join us to to develop new methods. You know, how are we going to address the mixture exposure problems? How are we going to address trajectory health, of the health effects? So here I show some examples like uh, uh, self-organized maps, which is a candidate to address some mixture exposure. And I took uh, a nice picture from Mark andre Werner's uh, publication. They're doing a model estimation of children's uh, blood concentration of PCBs or POPs and PFAS from mother's measurements. We need to address the critical windows of ex uh, exposures, you know? So uh, we, we, need to, we need to trust that whether the exposure during pregnancy is the matter or the current exposure matters. So that's the question we need to address, but we don't have the, the methods right now, so people are working on this, and I welcome uh, you know, those researchers working on these things. And then we are now working with 
the company who develops the sensors that can uh, that that is very tiny, tiny, and then that can monitor air pollution. This is my last slide, and then we need to think about path beyond. And um, so the clinical trial and birth cohort or epidemiology can address primary prevention. We can uh, identify risks, health risks, and then we can work on eliminating those health risks. But the path beyond is a primordial prevention. We need to create an environment. So according to the Winslow, the public health is a science and an art. And then environmental health being a branch of public health, it should include an art. We have to act. We have, our, as an environmental health scientist, we have to do science as well as we have to do action. So to create a healthy environment for future kids and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soji, and right on time. So that's great. We have time for a couple of questions. I invite you to come up to the microphone. Please announce who you are and where you're from. And um, yes, I think Ray is heading to the mic. Wonderful talk, thank you. This, I'm Raymond Neutra from California. Um, it occurs to me that every year thousands of new chemicals are put out into the environment. And we are investigating a few dozens of them. Um, We need to partner, I think, with some policy people to think about what would a different paradigm look like? Because when we've identified some of those dozens of chemicals that we're investigating and see that they indeed have profound effects, let's say, with autism, um, every year there's thousands more of which a few will be bad actors like that. And um, we can't even imagine a different paradigm, but we need to start imagining another paradigm. Thank you. I completely agree with that. So we need to have, yeah, policy. And then, but we all, as citizens, have to think about we really need them or not. And then probably we need to act uh, individually and also, and then the problem is that we cannot know what's in there too. <laughs> and then, so, um, so that's, I completely agree. I, can, I, I have nothing to, to add. <laughs> you have to elect a good president. <laughs> <laughs> Marike Kolossa right. from the German Environment Agency. Shulji, thank you very much for this very impressive talk. I have just one uh, small question to you. Which uh, place would you give the precautionary principle in the recommendations I guess you also have to develop uh, for your Ministry of the Environment, especially in this time frame when you are working on this fantastic cohort you are running? So precautionary principles? Well, that's... that's, that's <laughs> That's a difficult question, too. Um, so I envy European countries with that kind of uh, precursors, you know, principles. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to say gray is black instead of saying gray is white. Um, so we need, to, we need to have more like NPO or citizens engaged into uh, or those kind of community in you know, a society so that they can put up those uh, precautional uh, you know, principles. Um, but I would like to work with the industry 
And with that, I'd like to uh, work with the, uh, communicate better with the industry so that they could benefit themselves too from our study results. And then from your study, like HBN for EU too. So it's, it's, we, I think we need the communication with them. And then it's, it's an engagement stuff. We, we, I don't think we have a single question at this point. So, but if you have, please tell me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Suzy. Um, Zhang uh, from China Medical University, Taiwan. So thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I have two questions uh, uh, about the first one. As you know, for we conduct the cohort study, we have the um, major exposure. And your first cohort, I, will, I find you collect lots of compounds. So my qu first question is, what is your priority? Because we know for children's environments, they all always exposed to lots of the uh, chemicals or compound around, around the environment. So what is the uh, strategy to uh, identify the, uh, the major exposure for uh, the children's health? And my second question is, uh, I also consider for our living environments, we not only exposure to the uh, chemicals hazards, some uh, physical hazards also affect children's health. For example, um, for the big cities, the um, noise exposure is the uh, biggest issue, as well as currently use lots of electronic devices. Now, let's of course, some uh, EF exposure as well. So did you consider such, uh, as well as for the um, late change of uh, our um, uh, activity to uh, contact with uh, people? So, Maybe they have some uh, psychosocial problems. So did you uh, consider less the effects when you uh, established less cohort? Thank you. Thank you. So the priority thing, we don't prioritize. We, so that's our strategy. And I've been told to prioritize the chemicals, what to measure first. But I don't like to prioritize because we, don't want, we, we want to look at as many chemicals as possible. So uh, we do have to prioritize for the budgetary reason, you know, what measure, what we measure next year. But uh, for the study design, we do not prioritize. We do, we do look at everything, and then we try to look at everything. We try to use omics technologies, too, in our study. Though. And then for the second question, yes, I agree with you. So psychiatric environment and built environment, everything will cause children uh, uh, you know, health effects. So uh, we need to capture those. So we need to develop standardized tools, and then we need to harmonize those tools too among the researchers around the world. Every study uses different tools right now to address such kind of covariates. Uh, it used to be called covariates. We try to call them exposure at this point. So we need to have the tools to measure those exposure. I agree with you completely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again.